Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's show as we welcome uh, John Ivey to the program. John uh, works for North Carolina Cooperative Extension. He's an agent in Guilford County. Did I get Guilford right there, John? That is correct. Yes, you did. And the reason that we're talking is because Guilford Guilford County has recently opened a shared use kitchen that Cooperative Extension is involved uh, in. And uh, I just thought it was a fascinating uh, activity for Extension to to be involved in and thought we'd talk a little bit with John about it. So welcome to the podcast, John. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of it. So tell me a little bit about uh, Guilford County. Um, I, I've only been to North Carolina a couple of times, and usually that that's Charlotte. So uh, where's Guilford County, and, and what kind of setup you guys have there? So we are, Guilford County is located in the central Piedmont of North Carolina, which is about the center of the state. Um, and we literally are vertically about center in the state. Um, we are in an urban county. We do have a close to 600,000 person population here. Um, but at the same time, we do have... Um, estimated from our last ag census, we have over 800 farms here in Guilford County. Have you, are you uh, a native of North Carolina and Guilford County? How'd you get started uh, and end up as the agent in Guilford County? Yeah, well, I'm a native of North Carolina. I grew up in Raleigh. Um, I got my undergrad at NC State, and then I got my graduate at North Carolina A&T State, which is here in Greensboro. So while I was uh, wrapping up my graduate degree, I interned here at this office, and uh, I just am a blessed man and lucky enough that the agent that interned me was retiring that year. And, uh, I, I put in for the, uh, for the position and, you know, went through the process and lo and behold, uh, you know, we were blessed to not have to move my family to be part of extension. Yeah, that's cool. How long have you been at the office? So here I am starting, I'm about midway through my third year here. Okay. It's so in extension, I guess we consider that relatively new, right? And like right until you hit the 10 year, 15 year mark, right? You're a new agent. Yeah. Yeah. They say, uh, when I started, you know, my boss told me about year five, six, seven, you're starting to hit your stride at about year 10, you feel like you've got it under your belt. So <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> Ways to go. <laughs> well, it sounds like the, this project that you have going on now with the shared use, uh, kitchen is a great new thing that you're doing. Can you explain a little bit what a shared use kitchen is? Yeah, of course. So um, uh, there are a couple different uh, kitchen concepts here in North Carolina, and I'm not sure how they play out across the state because it, uh, what I found is it is dictated by local regulations. So we have what is called a commercial kitchen here, which is a commissary kitchen, a restaurant kitchen. So that is inspected by the Guilford County Health Department. Um, and that's where you see the, uh, the grades that they get, the numbers they get that they have to post. Those, co- those kitchens produce uh, uh, consumption-ready food. So what that means is you can actually serve it hot. People can eat there on site. For a low-risk shared-use kitchen here in North Carolina, it is inspected by our North Carolina Department of Agriculture, not our Guilford Health Department. So what that means is that none of our food can be consumption-ready on site. It can be consumption ready as long as it's packaged for retail sale. So um, what we have done here with the shared use kitchen is basically the same concept as having your own home kitchen certified so that you can do value added products at your own home. But what we have realized that there's a lot of folks who have pets or that live in apartment complexes. And as long as you do have either of those here in North Carolina, your home kitchen can't be certified. So we saw um, in 2013, we did a food access study, which uh, that year, Guilford County was ranked as the most food insecure county in the nation Mm. Um, um, through a food access study that our epidemiologist here in Guilford County did. At that point, the the county and the city of Greensboro did an access plan and an access study in which they identified four areas where we needed improvement, possibilities of shared and and commercial kitchens, um, food hubs, a mobile market, and a processing facility. Um, We are lucky enough to have a commercial kitchen maybe four miles down the road from us at a YWCA. Mm -hmm. So we did decided we didn't want to step on their toes or even, you know, go into competition with them. Um, We were very blessed to have a local food uh, supporter whose restaurant lost her lease back in December of last year. As opposed to selling off all of her equipment, she came to the city and came to myself and told us that she wanted to donate everything in a restaurant. Oh, wow. So 
we then um, developed a plan to use extension as a template on how to open up a low risk shared use kitchen with some of the equipment under the hopes that once we work out all of the kinks here, we can then begin to do this at our local parks and recreation centers so that folks that are in neighborhoods don't necessarily have to travel across town to come use this kitchen. If there's one, two miles from your house, makes it a lot more accessible. Um, our, our goal behind this was to provide um, a place for our farmers to produce um, value added products, shelf stable products, diversify their income streams. But what we realized in the process is a lot of farmers have this home kitchen already certified. So we then started looking at community members. And one of the things that I think most folks understand with community development is that empowerment of the community is a huge thing. Um, so we decided to use this and make the space open to our community members as well as kind of a kitchen incubator. Um, so we do provide the space as well as minimal training um, as far as taking you from the kitchen to the market. You mentioned the, the study on, on food security and uh, I hadn't even thought of the shared, shared use kitchen in that context. How uh, does a shared use kitchen, whether it's a low risk one like you guys have or a commercial one, uh, address food security? Um, for us, and I, and I won't speak too much on a commercial kitchen, but for a shared use kitchen for us, it, it's kind of a twofold effect. One is it allows our farmers to use their fresh fruits and vegetables to create a shelf stable product, which that can then be sold to our, to our community during the winter months when we're not in super high intensive fruit and vegetable production. So that allows continued access to fresh fruits and vegetables. The main thing that we're looking at is it provides an entrepreneurial opportunity for folks to come. And let's say, you know, grandmother made the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. Everybody has one of those recipes. Well, this is a low cost place where you can come make that recipe and then legally sell it anywhere in North Carolina. Be it, as long as you have the NCDA inspection certificate, you can sell it out of your car, you can sell it at your church, the farmer's markets, grocery stores, anything like that. So um, allows these folks to take the uh, take that and then possibly make some money. Our hope is, is that folks come and use our kitchen for say six months to a year and begin to make enough money and begin to make enough of a market share that they then can do either a, their own brick and mortar business or then latch on to another bigger commercial kitchen where they can really up their production. So it's to provide year round access to fresh fruits and vegetables, but at, at the same time to cr create an opportunity for entrepreneurs to actually make some money and then allow them to make their own decisions when it comes to access and, and purchasing of fresh fruits and vegetables. So how is it set up and run? How, how do people get access to the kitchen? Um, you know, what is, what is the charge for it? And uh, not like we're going to have a lot of listeners who are like lining up to use your kitchen, but I'm just interested in sort of uh, how it works and then how you, how you came up with that process, how you, how you set those parameters. It's, it's been a tricky process. So through our research, once we, we realized we might have this opportunity, I started looking at kitchens around North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and how many there were and how many have opened and closed over the past five years. And what we realized is that a majority of kitchens that open close. Um, and that's a, it's an unfortunate thing, but it's due to management. In order to operate a kitchen like this, if we were to be open five days a week or seven days a week, we would need probably at least one full-time kitchen manager and one part-time kitchen manager. So we've mitigated that by only being open twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays. And the beautiful thing of having it here at the extension site at our office is that there's always agents here. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, even if myself or my boss can't be here, we have five other people on staff who are certified. And when I say certified, I'll talk about the certifications here in just a minute to come out and make sure everything's sanitized when you get in there and when you leave. So we are lucky right now. Now we are always keeping our, you know, nose to the grindstone. And if we need to open up more, if it gets to the point to where we're having a lot of double bookings or uh, need for it, we can open up more. 
Um, but as an ag agent and not as a family consumer agent, my main dictate is to work with our farmers. So I had to make this manageable for myself until we could bring our new FCS agent up to speed and then allow him to take it over. In which case, once we do that, we'll kick this kitchen really into high gear and probably open up to three to five days a week. Mm. Um, as far as the process, we only require surf safe certification. So are you familiar with what surf safe is? It's yeah, the it's national food program. safety and yeah. All right. Food safety and food handling program. There are two levels, a managerial one, which is a full day class. Um, or the food handlers, which is a half-day class. We only require the food handler food safety aspect of it, although we definitely encourage folks to continue on with something like the managerial one or something like HACCP, which is Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Point um, Training and Certification. That, set, that training is much more intensive. There is a three-tiered uh, certification to it. But that's how folks then are able to do high-risk foods, pickling, acidified foods, meat, seafoods, things like that. It's a very expensive certification, around $900 to $1,200. We felt that would be cost prohibitive to a lot of our farmers as well as our community members. So here in North Carolina, ServSafe costs them anywhere from $150 to $175. We thought that's, you know, as long as they're getting the food safety and food handling aspect of it, which is the most important thing while you're in the kitchen, that the Department of Agriculture agreed with us that that would be minimum certification. So we do provide those trainings here at the office once a month. Um, we bring in a separate party right now to run those trainings. Once again, once we get our FCS agent up to speed, he is going to be the one that actually takes that over and can offer it. Our goal here is to be all inclusive. We're working to that. So once you get your certifications, you call myself, my boss, or one of our administrative assistants, and we schedule a time for you to come in, take a kitchen tour, go through the contract, go through our standing, standard operating procedures, allow us to see the certification to make sure everything's ready to rock and roll. Um, and then there's a $50 application fee, a $75 refundable security deposit, and then it's $10 an hour to rent our kitchen. Um, so that initial meeting is a come in kind of standard operating procedures. Hey, how are you? This is what we do. Here's what you want to do. The next meeting is the meeting where you come in ready to cook. And that first meeting, we have our um, inspector, our North Carolina Department of Agriculture inspector here, who then observes the process from you pulling in the parking lot and carrying everything in to the minute you, you're, you're wrapped up and you're packing everything out. Once you're done with that first initial meeting, you get a certificate from the Department of Ag stating that you are legal to sell your product, that you have produced it in a, you know, a good practices method, that she has observed that there is nothing that would create um, instances of contamination. And then you're legal to sell, like I said earlier, anywhere you want to, out of your car, on the corner, at a lemonade stand, supermarket, wherever you want to. So that's the process to get yourself here inside our kitchen. So how much does this streamline things? Or, or uh, Tell me, you've sort of alluded to this, but how does this really impact the farmer who's like, all right, I want to, you know, sell something? And, and sorry, throw a bunch of questions at you at once, but and what are the kinds of things that you're seeing being produced out of the kitchen? Well, so basically, we're seeing a lot of low risk. I'm going to answer this last question first. Low risk foods, jams, jellies, bread, pies, cakes, things like that. So the original concept for the farmer was back in the spring here, we had a hailstorm right as our strawberry season was getting ready to start. So I, actually, in some places, it already started. Well, the hailstorm damaged in places up to 75% of our crop that was out there. Now, those berries are just fine, but they have dents and dings in them. You can't take them to a market and actually expect your customers to buy it. So that was kind of the brainchild for this. It was like, well, darn, if we just lost 50 to 75% of our crop, and they've still got folks going through and cleaning them and pulling them and throwing them aside, why not provide a location where, hey, they're damaged, but it's still good fruit. Let's create, you know, put this into something and create a shelf-stable product. So at the very least, you can have something over the winter. So our first user created um, peach jelly um, and peach butterscotch jelly and different varieties of peach because our peach harvest was so small because of a late frost. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the concept behind it. Um, we also, you know, want to be able to help 
provide a situation where our farmers can do something with a glut. You know, when you have just so much, like here in North Carolina, summer squash and summer zucchini, just are, are when they come on, it's ridiculous. I mean, to the point to where homeowners have extra. So then making something like a zucchini bread, something that you can then freeze and still have when the zucchinis aren't here. Um, so that's, that's really what we were looking at for the farming aspect of it is just to, to reduce their loss and increase and diversify their income and their income stream. What was the biggest challenge in uh, getting things set up? Like, what what had you tearing your hair out? Oh, well, you know, as they say, there's nothing for free. Even though we got free equipment, it took a lot of time and a lot of headaches. I think the biggest thing was for us, um, and the reason why we wanted to be a template, it was policy and regulation. When it came down to who inspects what, does the health department or does the Department of Ag, when I initially started, I went to them and they each referred me to a website or a PDF file, um, 17 pages long with a bunch of legal stuff that, you know, me as an agricultural professional had to plow through and couldn't even understand. And so I understood why farmers and homeowners were reluctant. So ultimately, I had to get our head inspector for the health department and our department of ag inspector into the same room and say, okay. What is it that you guys inspect? And there was still a lot of this. I don't know. That person does. It, you know, <laughs> so we, uh, you know, through a couple meetings, had to plow through little things. Like if you use raw honey, that's a department of bag. But if you bake with honey, then the Guilford Health Department has to inspect it. Well, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, but that is the regulation. So we've been able to kind of streamline what it is that, can come out of our kitchen and what it is they can. Um, and we're currently working on a publication to provide to both the NCDA and the health department along with our clientele through extension of, okay, plain, simple English, none of this, you know, maybe so whatever could be possibly, no, let's streamline it so that folks know exactly what it is. And that has taken say December of last year till now. So, you know, we're getting, we're probably by the end of the year, hope to have it done. So it, that, that's been the biggest headache, which unfortunately policy and regulation typically is in my world. Yeah. Bureaucracy. That's always, uh, that's always <laughs> fun, right? Exactly. Um, as you were looking around at, at other kitchens in, in your region, other shared use kitchens, uh, did you find examples uh, where cooperative extension is, is highly involved in them or, or are there other cases in North Carolina where cooperative extension is involved in a shared use kitchen? There are, and, and most of these concepts that I have seen um, were started by extension. Um, so they were, they were either a partner at the table or it was an extension-led project. Um, however, I will tell you this, you know, one of the things that they have taught us as a young agent is always have an exit strategy, always have a plan for, for the program. Um, and I think that that's where I've seen most kitchens have failed is the management aspect of it. So it gets to be too much. So either A, they close, or B, they ship it and sell it or, or ship, shift the concept to a private owner. Um, and so there are some examples of great, um, there's one in Hillsborough, North Carolina, of a really, Hillsborough, Durham area, of a great commercial shared use kitchen attached to a market. Um, that's probably our best shining example. Um, but there, there are not, I believe when I first started this in December, there were five commercial slash shared use kitchens that extension were helping manage or run throughout the state. Um, since then, I know the one in the County North of me has closed and turned over to a private entity, which is typically what happens. So I, I was lucky enough to have some examples of success and some of failure to help really guide our decision-making through this process. Yeah, it really. I mean, it fascinated me because I guess um, I've. I don't think right off the bat uh, in terms of what cooperative extension provides as as facilities, as space, right. you know, as that kind of service. Was that something that came up either in, inside your county or or with North Carolina cooperative extensions? Like, should we really be doing this? Or well, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I did meet some resistance from NC State, um, our specialist because they've gone through this so many times with other folks. And as I said, it's usually get turned, you know, gets so concept gets turned over to a private entity or it gets closed. Um, however, 
once they started understanding where we really wanted to go with it to not be the big commercial super management intensive super labor intensive but instead be a vehicle for entrepreneurial um, beginnings as well as being a template and a community leader on how to do this especially in our limited resource areas neighborhoods at those parks and rec center um, the university really got on board with it at that point it's a different kind of concept as I think some of the other kitchens um, as far as uh, as far as you know where I guess where we're going from here is we we hope within next year to start opening these up at our parks and recs. We've also gone after a couple of grants. Now, one thing I should say, this has been a 100% grassroots kitchen. So the only donations we have have been from, um, from that restaurant. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, that also separates us. We haven't gone after grant funding yet. I say that now we've put in for a USDA grant with the city of Greensboro and with a farmer's market here so that Weed Extension can now have the opportunity to take you from your initial food safety and food handling classes being taught here on site to then teaching you how to deal with the Department of Agriculture. Then if we get this grant, we are going to provide a table for our users for one Saturday at our busiest farmer's market here so that that way they can do market research. So then once we get that, we'll be able to take them from product being made to product being bottled, jarred, canned, frozen, whatever, to how do you do your label? How do you do marketing? To, all right, you're at the market. How do you track numbers? So we can now through this entire process pretty much touch on everything that Extension does here from agriculture to uh, family consumer sciences, even down to food and nutrition plan, food education and nutritional planning. So it's really, I, I didn't realize this when we started, but it appears that we're going to be able to include almost every one of our agents um, in the process from taking somebody from when they first get here to hopefully when they break out and open their own business. So I know it's, um, you guys just opened like last month, right? Or Yes, yes, August 8th. Yeah, so, so what's the response been so far? So far, um, I think we've had a pretty, good, a pretty good turnout and a pretty good response. Um, we started advertising a little bit early in the game. Um, I was hoping to have it open by June, so I really got aggressive in April and May. Um, however, with dealing with, since this is a county property, we had to deal with county government as far as our contracts, liability insurances, all of these things. And that's been a little bit of a kind of a massaging a situation to make it more, um, more accessible to folks. Um, right now, currently we have five full-time users. And when I say full-time, that means they use it at least three times a month and two part-time users who have been in once or twice. Um, now the other thing we're tracking is that because you can have this done at your own home, a lot of folks don't know that. So some of the folks that were coming in, that's, I explained to them, you know, it's a free service from the Department of Ag. It costs you nothing to get certified or to have your kitchen certified. However, why don't you come through the process here and have your product certified on our site? That way you've got a rapport with the Department of Ag inspector. You understand the process and then go have your home kitchen certified. So I'm also tracking that because that is still getting education from the extension, although they might not fully be utilizing our resources. Right. And we've actually seen quite a few more of that kind of clientele than the permanent user. Um, you know, it's one of those things, it's $10 an hour. And if you don't have a pet and you have a home, you really can save yourself, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80 bucks just by doing it at your house. But we also want you to understand what you have to do. And that's kind of where we're set up here to do. Do you have advice for other agents who might be thinking of specifically shared use kitchens or even just like providing other kinds of facilities? Are there, you know, whether that might be, I know we've had some people do maker spaces and some other mm -hmm. things. Um, what advice do you have for agents kind of just thinking this, going this different route? Well, I'll say I got a couple couple pieces of advice you remember I said this earlier there's no such thing as a free lunch there's not you know even though we got a lot of free equipment it is taking a, you know a lot of people including myself but a lot of people to help get us to this point um, 
the other thing I would caution people if they're looking at a project like this to understand the management aspect of it. Like I said, just through my research and, uh, and, and going through this process, the, the process to get to where we are has taken so much time that it has been really tricky to balance what my job responsibilities are and what this wonderful idea we have is. Um, so just be cautious of that. And the, the piece of advice, the, the encouraging piece of advice I'd give people is if you think it's a good idea and your community members or your clientele back you up, go, go for it. You know, like I said, I met some resistance at the beginning when they were saying, oh, you can't do this. It's going to close, blah, blah. Well, you know what? After persistence and consistency of getting in touch with them and, and having them, my specialist, learn my idea, now all of a sudden they're on board. So right. if, if you see the need, then, then go for it. Great. Well, thanks, John, so much for taking the time to talk to us about your shared use kitchen in Guilford County, North Carolina. Uh, John Ivey is a North Carolina Cooperative Extension agent in Guilford County. Thanks so much for listening to today's edition of uh, Working Differently in Extension podcast. You can find us on Twitter at WDNEXT. All the podcasts are up at soundcloud.com slash working differently and the show notes at bobbirch.com. Thanks again for joining us. We'll talk to you soon.